please welcome Vivek Ramaswamy to the soapbox. I appreciate it. It's good to see you guys. It's great to be here. So look, one of the reasons I love Iowa, and we have to keep the first in the nation caucus status intact, is this. There are no social media algorithms in the air between us, right? There's no TV screens. It's us here in the open, having a conversation. So I'm gonna kick this off and then I wanna hear from you. What we gotta do is close the gap between what people are saying in public and what people are willing to say in private. Close that gap, the only way we're gonna do it is to speak openly. So let me tell you, speak the truth. That's right, we can handle the truth. That is who we are. Tell you a bit about myself, I'm seeing a lot of new faces today. My parents came to this country 40 years ago with literally no money. I've gone on to found multi-billion dollar companies. I did it while marrying my lovely wife, Apoorva, who's here today. The, a, real, a real doctor, that's right. <laughs> I know the connotation you meant, but she is a real doctor. <laughs> Our kids are somewhere on that Ferris wheel. And that's the American dream. I am genuinely worried that our two sons will not be able to live that same American dream unless we do something about it. We're in the middle of a national identity crisis. Faith, patriotism, hard work, family. These things have disappeared only to be replaced by poison. You can debate what the poison is. Wokeism, gender ideology, climatism, COVIDism, depression, anxiety, fentanyl, suicide. It is not a coincidence that we see the rise of these same poisons at the same time. These are symptoms of a deeper void of identity and purpose and meaning. And I'm speaking to you as a member of my generation. I'm 38 years old. I am the youngest person ever to run for U.S. president in a major party. And I love seeing young people here. Here's the thing about us. I think it's true of all of us. We are hungry for a cause. We are starved for purpose and meaning and identity at a time when the things that used to fill that void, they've disappeared. So this is our moment, guys. And not just as conservatives, as Americans, to step up and fill that void with a vision of what it means to be an American today. What does it mean to be American? It means we believe in the ideals of the American Revolution. It means we believe in 1776 means we believe in ideals like meritocracy and the pursuit of excellence, that you get ahead in this country, not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. That is why we're done with affirmative action in America. It has been a cancer on our national soul. It means we believe in the rule of law, that people like my parents, people like Swallow, who has been coming to our events, there you are, Swallow, who came to this country legally as patriots through the front door, get to come to this country legally. But it also means that your first act of entering this country cannot break the law. That is why we will use the U.S. military to secure that southern border. That is what it means to stand for the rule of law. It means that the people who we elect to run the government ought to be the ones who actually run the government. Not the deep state managerial bureaucracy that runs the show today. <laughs> so if I can't be your next president for more than eight years, that's great. I don't want to do it for more than eight years. That's a good thing. But neither should any of those federal bureaucrats reporting into me either. That is how you actually drain the swamp. Take those government agencies that should not exist from the FBI, to the IRS, to the CDC, to the ATF, to the Department of Education. We will get in there and shut it down. That is how we revive the integrity 
of a constitutional republic. I'll tell you something about me, all right? You are not going to see me here bashing the other good people who are running in this race. These are our colleagues. I'm going to depend on each of them just as I depend on you to revive this country. But we do face a choice in this primary. The choice is this. Do you want incremental reform or do you want revolution? I stand on the side of revolution. I stand on the side of the American Revolution, that we the people create a government that is accountable to us, not the other way around. That we the people require a government that tells us the truth. The truth about where COVID-19 came from. The truth about that Hunter Biden laptop. The truth about vaccine mandates, school closures. The truth about the Nashville shooter manifesto. The truth about what's happening in our country today. That is what this campaign is about. We stand for the truth. I speak that truth without apology. God is real. There are two genders. Fossil fuels are a requirement for human prosperity. Reverse racism is racism. An open border is not a border. Parents determine the education of their children. The nuclear family is the greatest form of governance known to mankind. Capitalism lifts us up from poverty. There are three branches of government, not four. And the U.S. Constitution, it is the strongest guarantor of freedom in human history. That is the truth. We stand up for the truth. We fight for the truth. And I'll say this in closing before we open this up, all right, for questions. I grew up into a generation where we were taught to celebrate our diversity and our differences so much that we forgot all of the ways that we are all just the same as Americans, bound by a common set of ideals that set this country into motion in 1776. I believe it deep in my bones that those ideals still exist. I need your help to revive them. E pluribus unum, from many, one. That is the dream that won us the American Revolution. That is the dream that reunited us after the Civil War. That is the dream that won us two world wars and the Cold War. That is the dream that still gives hope to the free world today. And if we can revive that dream over group identity and victimhood and grievance, then nobody in the world not a nation, not a corporation, not a virus is going to defeat us. That's what American exceptionalism is all about. And that is what we together will revive to save this great nation. God bless you. God bless your families. Thank you for that warm welcome. Let's open this up and have a conversation. Love it. I'm going to give you the microphone. You come up here, brother. Come on up. Come on up. Everybody's going to hear you say it. How do you want to get the economy revved up again? Oh, we're going to get the economy revved up. Here's how you do it. It's actually really simple. GDP growth, not 1%, 5%. How do we get there? Unapologetically. Do not apologize for capitalism. Do not apologize for excellence. Drill, frack, burn coal, embrace ethanol, use nuclear, unlock American energy. That's the first step. Second step, don't pay people to stay at home instead of to go to work. Put people back to work. That's who we are as Americans. Third step, 
Reform the U.S. Federal Reserve. You don't need to play financial god. Stabilize the dollar. Tie it to gold, silver, nickel, agricultural commodities. Stabilize the U.S. dollar. And then you get in there, and we will drain that swamp, shut down the three-letter agencies that act like a wet blanket on the U.S. economy. 75% headcount reduction of employees in Washington, D.C. in my first term. That's how you get to 5% growth. That is American exceptionalism. Thank you. Next question. Hi, Vivek. Thanks for coming to Iowa. Um, first of all, I love seeing you on the All In podcast. You were fantastic. Thank you for doing that. The voice, so amazing. So your wife's a doctor. You're at the Iowa State Fair. What foods are you allowed to eat here? Get up here. Get up here. So funny story. I was, I was like stuffing my face with some funnel cake last night. I tried to find my cell phone. By the time I turn around, it's the, half, the second half of it's gone. And here's the person who made that happen. <laughs> um, to be clear, I ate it. <laughs> um, but, you know, we love the eggs. Oh, that yeah. was so good. Egg stick was good. And I just had the most delicious thin mint ice cream that I've ever had. And there's right now, apparently, there's some Girl Scouts who are serving it. So ex double whammies. Most importantly, you can get Thin Mints out of season right now. So, huge hit. <laughs> that strawberry ice cream is keeping me real fit right now. That's what's going on. Please. Please. Uh, your first tenant is God is real. Yes. What do you mean by that? I mean that we are one nation under a single God. I believe there is a higher power. I believe there is one true God. I believe we were a nation built under God. I believe that we are all equal because we are all made in the image of God. That is where our equality comes from. It doesn't come from some nebulous secular value. It comes from the fact that we are equal in the eyes of each other, as Reagan said it too, because we are equal in the eyes of God. That is what unites us. And you think about this. I don't care if you're black or white or Democrat or Republican or blue or green or anything. I could care less. If we remember that one thing, that is how we get back to national unity. That is what, as a member of a different generation, I am in this race to restore. We'll go here and then there. You're fantastic. That was a great answer. As President of the United States, will you recognize the personhood of the unborn child under Amendment 14 and 5? So unborn life is life. That is what I stand for. I don't wish to apologize for my perspective. I am unapologetically pro-life. And the reality is, this doesn't have to be so divisive, guys. It really doesn't. I, I will, I'll give you a challenge. It'll just say we can get back to national unity. There's a case, Clarence Thomas brought it up. Pregnant woman walking down the street, the unborn child dies as a result of an assault. I can't find one American in this country who will say that that criminal does not deserve liability for that death. What does that say? We share these instincts in common. And for my part, I will walk the walk. Here's what I'll say. We can have a conversation about paths to adoption, to child care, to greater sexual responsibility for men in an era of paternity tests. So I will walk the walk. But this isn't about men's or women's rights. It's about human rights. We have to all be in this together. That's where I land on it. Disincentivizing fatherlessness, such an important question. So, so this is important to me and to Apoorva both, okay? Neither of us grew up in money. Both of our parents came to this country with literally nothing to their name. But both of us actually had the ultimate privilege. You hear that word bandied around a lot these days, privilege. I'll admit it, I had it. Two parents in the house with a focus on education and instilling in us in a faith in God. That is the ultimate privilege. So how do we stop the fatherlessness epidemic where one out of four kids in this country are denied that privilege? Stop paying people to live in fatherless homes. I visited the south side of Chicago. I went to Kensington in the middle of the inner city of Philadelphia, places where Republican candidates are taught by the political consultants not to go. I reject their advice. I'm not running to lead a political party. I am running to lead a nation, so we will show up. And I don't blame the single mothers there 
who are paid more not to have a man in the house than to have the man in the house. I blame the federal government. And it is my job to get in there and fix it. We will not use your money to pay people to do the opposite of what is right for them. More money not to have that man in the house. More money not to go to work. More money not to repay your student loan debts. More money in Kensington to have a crack pipe and free needles rather than to get off drugs. That's what we need is a government that stops using our money to pay people to do what is even worse for them in the name of help. That is not compassion, that is cruelty. And I stand for that without apology. Right here. Come on up and you get the microphone. Okay, first of all, I love you. Um, <laughs> second of all, if you are not um, able to secure the nomination, would you accept the job as vice president? Thank you. So my friend Donald Trump is arriving and he and I share something in common. Neither of us do pretty well in a number two position, okay? So I expect that he will be my advisor, and, and, and I expect he will accept that job. So we're running for the next generation, and to the, to the truth, truth of the matter, let's just speak truth. MAGA, America first, this is bigger than one man. It does not belong to me, it does not belong to Trump, it belongs to you, it belongs to us. We the people, how do we take this to the next generation? That's what this is about, thank you for that. When you are in a position to select your vice president, what attributes are you looking for to complement your values? How old are you? 13 years old. Let's give her a round of applause. See, that's that next generation I'm talking about right there. So proud of you. What's your name? Haley. Haley? I saw you this morning too, didn't I? Yes. You came double decker. I love that. Thank you. So look. I think the vice president is one of many important positions. Here's the attributes I look for though, alignment on the constitution. That's the thing that's most important of all. Whether it's vice president, to office of management and budget, to the office of personnel management, to the cabinet, they have to share my view that there are three branches of government, not four, okay? So that administrative deep state, it's gotta go. That is the source of our national cancer. And so I don't want a vice president or a staff that acts like a mediator between me and the administrative state. I don't want a mediator. I want a bulldog who is gonna see through a vision that revives the integrity of our republic. It's not a Democrat or Republican issue. It is the fact that we want the people who we elect to actually be accountable to us, to we the people, and I require a vice president who is loyal not to me, but to that vision. I appreciate that, Haley. Back there, go ahead, loud. You're right. So, so this is the answer. This is, this is a debate we face. Thank you for projecting, that's, that's powerful. So the question is how do you deal with the deep state, particularly the federal police state, which does not apply one standard of justice, it has two standards of justice. That's a reality. We do, unfortunately, have two standards of justice in this country. One for Antifa and BLM, one for concerned parents who show up at school board meetings called domestic terrorists, right? So how do we solve it? So when you have a bureaucracy that should not exist, that is a formula for corruption. That is why I have said, and this has been very controversial, the press has attacked me for this, I've said that I will not just reform the FBI, fire Christopher Wray or something like this. I don't believe in incremental reform. I stand for revolution. We will shut down the FBI. That is how you drain the actual source of the problem. But I also want to tell those of you who think, does that sound extreme? Is this guy <laughs> a little crazy, <laughs> a little, little bit of a young lunatic here? Actually, it's deeply practical. And let me explain to you why. There's 35,000 employees at the FBI. Nobody's offered this kind of detail before. The detail matters. You guys are Iowa, you can handle it. 35,000 employees. 20,000 of them are in back office functions, going into the J. Edgar Hoover building of the FBI, reporting in for work every day. They should find honest work in the private sector, and under my watch, they will. There's 15,000 good people on the front lines. We're gonna reassign them to the US Marshals, to the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. They're much better at fighting crime, much better at stopping the child sex trafficking rings in this country. The US Marshals are way better than the FBI at that. So this is deeply practical. This is also how we actually protect Americans 
while also restoring true integrity in our government. Love your shirt, so I'm gonna you get, come to you next. Loud. Love that. So what Jesuit high school do you go to, Loyola? St. Ignatius. So St. Ignatius guy here. I'm a St. X guy. So he knows I went to a Jesuit high school. It actually had a deep impact on me. So there's one Jesuit expression. Jesuits are for the, you know, uh, intellectual breed of Catholicism that's actually thinking about what we aspire to. There's a term that they teach you at St. Ignatius, the magis, the more. So the magis refers to the idea that we seek more of ourselves, that we expect more of the people closest to us and of ourselves to push each other, our classmates in high school, to new heights we would not have reached. We call that the magis. St. X's slogan was men for others. But the reason we said men for others is how do you do it for others? You push others to do more for others than they otherwise could have done. That is what it means to be American, actually. We aspire to the more. We as Americans, we're the pioneers. We're the explorers. We're the people who nobody's going to stop. There ain't going to be a government that stands in our way from stopping me from achieving my maximal potential. So yes, did that, did that class in ninth grade in St. X High School influence me as now a presidential candidate? And hopefully, if you all are willing, your next president, you're darn right they do. And I'm proud of you for bringing up your Jesuit values too. Okay, last, I, I'm told... I'm being given a red sign that says time is up. So I'm going to close with this. Let me just close with this. No, but he's doing his job. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. And, you know, I'm glad the Des Moines Register is doing this. Do I agree with everything they print? No, I don't. But open dialogue, this is what we need. So thank you to them. The thing I will say, I told some of you this this morning. I want to say it again because it's so important. We are not a nation in decline. We don't have to be. Both parties teach us that, that somehow we're at the end of the Roman Empire. We're on our way down. We're like ancient Rome, crumbling to pieces. We don't have to be a nation in decline. We don't have to be Rome. I think the truth is, as a nation, we, like Haley sitting right here, we as a nation are really just a little young going through our own version of adolescence, figuring out who we're really going to be when we grow up. And when you view it that way, you know, you're a teenager, you go through adolescence. You might have your self-confidence shaken from time to time. You lose your sense of who you are. I don't know about you, but I certainly did. But we are stronger for it when we get to our adulthood on the other side. So we don't have to be a nation in decline. I think we are a nation still in our ascent, in the early stages of our ascent, still on our way to that mountaintop, that shining city on a hill where no matter who you are, where your parents came from, what your skin color is, you achieve anything you ever want in this country with your own hard work, your own commitment, your own dedication. That is the American dream. That is what we are running to. That is what we together will revive to save this great nation. Thank you all. God bless you. God bless your families. And God bless our great country. Thank you. Thank you.